Okay, we are back with uh, Martin Levine, a former visa. Levine, Levine. oh, I did it again. <laughs> a uh, former visa officer and ATIP officer. Uh, the episode that we did with him was very well received. We had a lot of follow-up questions and you have uh, generously agreed to come back. Um, <laughs> what was interesting was we also had, I think you saw on LinkedIn, at least one or two people who follow you on Quora. Who yeah. uh, chimed in, which was interesting. Um, the the big question that we got first. Thanks for coming back on. My pleasure. Uh, so the big question that people were like, you know, a few people said you didn't. We didn't speak about enough, and it's an area that I'll admit that I don't know as much about as maybe I should, which is the role of locally engaged staff uh, abroad and what role they play. Well, what role do they play compared to, say, a Canadian who goes abroad yeah, in the visa decision-making process? There's different types of locally engaged staff, and it varies from one visa office to another. Uh, generally, all the clerical staff in the immigration section of the consulate or embassy are locally engaged. Now, locally engaged can include third-party nationals. So it's not necessarily all the local engaged staff are uh, citizens of the country that you're in. Also, they do try to provide some more opportunities for Canadian spouses and partners. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you get a Canadian spouse or partner working there. Um, as I recall, there were some local engaged officers above the registry staff who were permitted to make non-immigration decisions, so visitor decisions only. And then there were the ones who essentially had equivalent authority to a Canada-based visa officer. And so they do, so at some visa offices, they can make decisions about visitor visas. Do you know work permit, study permit as well? Or? Yeah. Again, depending, depending. So issue, frankly, there's an issue about how reliable locally engaged staff can be because, uh, Unfortunately, in some of the countries where we operate, corruption is endemic and family and other pressures in our officer, our local engaged officer to give out details that should not be given out are very heavy. So the managers have to assess that. So when you were there, what were there, were there instances where I guess info was leaked or things like that um, from locally engaged staff? Because that was yeah. a, like, that's something like a, People were saying, you don't know the power, Steve, of the locally engaged staff, uh, which yes. I don't know that I do. Um, I do recall that information was leaked only a few times. Generally, we were lucky, or I was lucky, not to be in uh, Canadian visa offices where it was an endemic problem. But yes, I did see a few instances, and of course, the individuals had to be fired. Yeah. And does it... Like, because we had talked about how Canadians would kind of rotate through different visa posts. Is there, is locally engaged staff, is it a full time permanent job or is it also a contract of like two, three years? Uh, generally, it's a full time a permanent job. So, to what extent then would it be the case, like, you know, they say that in politics that governments come and go, but the bureaucracy kind of dictates things because they're permanently there. Uh -huh. Like, to what extent can local, if, if the Canadians are coming and going, to what extent does like locally engaged staff kind of just run the visa office? Well, it's the responsibility of the visa office manager as a rotational foreign service officer to rein them in. Some of them are not so good at it, unfortunately. Others are very, very strict and lay down the line with local engaged staff. This is your role. If I catch any, to catch any of you leaking information, you're fired right out of here, that type of thing. Um, Line visa officers have a problem that I alluded to in my first interview and that they're not really at all encouraged to talk out of turn. So unless you believe that uh, a locally engaged staff person is doing something very, very wrong, you keep quiet. Uh, a simple difference of opinions over a decision would not be sufficient unless you felt that the local engaged officer could have been wrongly influenced or it's just very, very derelict. But uh, you have to accept the fully qualified ones who are qualified to make immigration decisions operate on the same level as you. And I've been in uh, visa offices where the managers would not, the office manager would not convene a separate meeting for Canadian officers only. 
the officer insisted that all meetings be open to both Canadian visa officers and local officers who had the same functions as Canadian visa officers. So it's not all that easy to rein them in and you have to watch what they say because you, I mean, local Canadian staffing mostly indeterminate. And there's some contract workers, but certainly at the officer level, they tend to be indeterminate. One advantage that they have is emotional in that uh, people build up a regard for the good ones. So you just got there last week, they're from Ottawa, you've been posted, and you see a, a local engaged officer doing something you don't understand or something like that. You have to consider that person may be very well liked in the office, especially among other local engaged staff. Uh, you've been there a week. Uh, do you want to stir up trouble? I wouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. During COVID, I know that there were, uh, just from reading ATIP's issues, where during work from home, there were big concerns about whether locally engaged staff could be permitted to work from home due to mm -hmm. data privacy and everything. What what percent of like, I mean, I guess it would vary visa post to visa post, but say like, I don't know, the bigger ones, New Delhi, Nairobi, Beijing, would be locally engaged staff versus... Oh. Canada visa officers most yeah. most yeah when you see pre-assessment i mean i mean this may be like you know too current for when you work there but like oftentimes you'll see now a file and global case map first of all would global case management system kind of i would have my understanding is every time a file gets looked at there's a record of who's looking at it like in your experience did that kind of reduce some of these concerns about information being leaked I never used GCMS. It was after my time. Uh, certainly, I'm trying to recall what keeps was like. I don't think there is a record accessible of who had accessed keeps. Yeah, maybe wrong. I may be wrong. Maybe a tech expert could do it, but uh, you couldn't. Like a line officer could not uh, look at the keeps record. Uh, they couldn't discern whether anybody else had looked up the information unless, of course, they made a note. Maybe GS mm -hmm. CMS has a better functionality. I'm not sure. Do you think, uh, and, and what about interviews? Who would do interviews overseas? Is that like for the genuineness of a spousal sponsorship? Uh, frequently, fully, fully authorized local engaged officers would do it. Often they were better than you because they knew the local culture. They're more sensitive to cues when somebody might be lying in that door type of thing. So often they were superior, as long as they were trustworthy, to yeah. uh, do that type of work. Now, of course, the interview isn't what it used to be in my day. It's vastly declined in importance. So how, and like if it's an issue of malfe of uh, outright fraud, it's no longer visa officers who do it. It's officers of CBSA. So yeah, the risk assessment unit, I think, is what they call it now, all the fraud investigations. Uh, I think that's how CBSA does it. Again, I never worked for them, but as I understand it, they have uh, a quite an elaborate system for screening for fraud and then moving on to do what happens next. But yeah. we don't, we, uh, these officers would not be privy to that information. But that's yeah. confidential information. It is a property of CBSA. Uh, it's not shared. It's not shared. That's their procedure. No, and that's becoming like I actually just tweeted. It's becoming a, an issue in some files where a procedural fairness letter and a visa officer refusal notes will say this document was confirmed to be fraudulent, and it's never clear throughout the whole process at the judicial review why. And we it's another say. unit. Yeah. Uh, um, you can't put in your notes that I am in contact with so and so an officer uh, at CBSA in whatever foreign city. Uh, that officer has done checks for their procedures and has determined that this document that was submitted that is relevant to the application is bogus. You can't do that. Yeah, it, I mean, I can hear listeners going, "Well, then, how are people supposed to know?" I mean, there's the two. They're not supposed the two to sides to it, right? Of like making sure that there's some oversight on these fraud investigations. Well, it's like any versus other... as soon as people know what the investigation tip is, you plan around it. Yeah, it's like a police procedure. That information yeah. will not be released. 
it would compromise the whole system. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's a tough balance. The other, I just uh, before we get to the next topic, one of um, oh, there's an Aaron O'Toole during the 2021 election had said uh, in the conservative campaign campaign platform that all visa office interviews would be recorded with a copy of the recording provided <laughs> you're laughing so i i, I can't sorry. tell if that's a laugh because it's so specific or that you think it's a bad idea a good idea uh it's partially cynicism and amazement i mean yeah i mean again the volume of interviews is not what it was i very much doubt that cpsa or the rcmp or thesis yeah. are going to let their interviews be recorded and when it comes to issues of fraud or national security, they're the meat. Yeah. Not the. What visa. about like in a, a genuineness interview, like whether a marriage is real? Uh, I doubt that would ever be allowed. Partially, it's uh, legislative in that um, Canada does have an equivalent to Miranda rights, but it's not fully equivalent with American Miranda rights, where you're. Uh, a person who's accused of a crime has a right to have a counsel when they're being questioned. So the basis by which anybody could insist that an interview be recorded is thin in Canada. And just the technicality of having servers that could accommodate God knows how many thousands of interviews. You know? <laughs> that's, that's still, I mean, the interview is not gone. And yeah. many, many of them are now... As I understand, some of them are done remotely by something like Zoom. I would very much doubt that that would ever be done. They'd be really... Well, I right now, during the Zoom ones, they specifically instruct applicants, like, turn off all recordings, definitely don't hit record. Uh-huh. Um, which I don't fully... I mean, I guess there's the concern, again, with the same investigative, like, the, if the questions are known... And people will plan their interviews around the questions. That, that's an issue. Yeah. But again, in my first interview, I referred to the visa office and the entire structure of immigra structured immigration being very hierarchical. The only person in the office that assesses your performance as a line visa officer is first your immediate manager and then the manager of the office. Uh, there's no role for anyone else to be a scrutinizer. Like, what if, for example, uh, an officer, who, and it unfortunately does happen, who's formed a, a manager, I should say, who's formed a real dislike of you, decides to uh, knock you down in your praise and said, When you person, say, like, form a dislike of you, are you talking about dislike of the client or a dislike of a, a, a employee? Your manager dislikes manager you. Manager dislikes who, though? Dislikes a visa officer or dislikes, dislikes the, the, visa the applicant? Officer. Dislikes the visa officer. Dislikes yeah. That's very common. Um, but say... All interviews were recorded, so you could access, maybe through access to information procedures, all the interviews that you, the visa officer, did. Uh, and I don't know how they handle the information given out by the applicant, but some of it would be your personal information. But you could show that your interview skills were impeccable, superior. Like you could produce maybe a random sample of 10 different interviews on 10 different topics, visitor, immigration, refugee, that you did at different times. And even the fairest bar in Canada would say, this is a perfect visa officer, absolutely fair, mm -hmm. uh, totally schooled in the law, observes all procedural fairness procedures. So you have some manager simply dislikes you sometimes intensely, and you come back. You go back and you can test that. You could even launch a lawsuit uh, stating that this is manifestly uh, maleficent appraisal, manifestly unfounded and uh, unfair and evil in intent. So yeah. I can't imagine, uh, certainly not immigration, certainly not uh, CSIS or the CBSA ever, ever permitting that to happen. Yeah, there's two there's two avenues that I want to take this. And I think I'll go with one that stems again from the judicial review practice, which is that oftentimes when it comes to these interviews, you'll have these officer notes saying one thing, applicants saying, I didn't say that, I said something else. Unfortunately, they normally don't have notes that they've also taken no. at the same time. The courts will generally say that... Um, the applicant may have a motivation 
to misremember or lie about what happened at the interview because they have a personal stake mm -hmm. in the interview. Whereas the visa officer is this neutral, emotionless, kind of independent third party that don't really have a stake in. And I've often wondered or occasionally wondered how true is that? Because there are people, too, who can form a dislike of the person they're interviewing or something mm -hmm. like that. Oh, like, yeah. Yeah. So what where what do you think that generally that legal principle? Well, there's the separate like is the legal is the legal principle right? And is the legal principle accurate? Um, because sometimes you need a legal principle that's right, even if it might be inaccurate, like the idea that visa officers are able to read every word on an application may be inaccurate, but the whole system depends on it, as one yeah. judge put it to me. Do you think it's factually accurate, ignoring whether the principle is right, that these officers are always just these neutral, not forming opinions of their clients? Well, um, yeah. what I'd say about that, uh, and again, maybe some visa officer be, would be most unhappy, and I'm sure the bar and the general public would not like to hear it. Visa officers perform a police function. Interesting. Uh, it's essentially law enforcement. I mean, it used to be long ago that we had promotion. We go to different places. I did it myself and make uh, promotional presentations about how good Canada is. We look for really promising applicants, but then the principle of self-selection triumph over that because it spent less resources. Uh, I have to admit, I'm an aficionado on YouTube, if I can mention that, uh, of uh, American police videos, body cam videos. You have to essentially adopt the same stance as that police officer. You know, these officers don't have body cams, but you still have to, if you're professional and you don't want to get fired or permanently remain at a working level, you have to have a police attitude. You cannot be provoked. Uh, you cannot get distracted by the applicant behaving in a way that's annoying, but not related to their admissibility. I mean, anybody can be obnoxious. Anybody can be very slow. Anybody can be hostile, that type of thing. Uh, but like any policeman, you've just got to disregard it. Get on with your job, which is applying the law. And that is what visa officers do. They're, as I said before, they're not social workers. They're not there to help the applicant. They're not the enemy of the applicant. They're not trying to look for ways to get them. You're there to apply the law as it stands. It's yeah. a police function, essentially. And I'm not saying that in a mean way, but it is. It's comparable to what uh, any police officer investing, investigating a DUI would do. Yeah, no, so it's like, yeah, the police officer comparison is, I mean, I, I'm just, just deciding to really go in like body cams back to things being, in, well, in terms of the police, I mean, I, I think that like, it kind of goes back to where I was saying in our previous conversation about whether they should have that discretion of once they've spotted a crime, say misrep, of whether to proceed or not, because the police, when you interact with them, always do have that discretion ultimately of whether to arrest someone, whether to just, you know, warn them. Um, I don't know. think managers in a visa office would cede authority to a line level officer, either Canadian or locally engaged to make that determination. It just would not. So You've already determined uh, a, a fraudulent document that's so glaringly fraudulent that you know the person has rendered themselves inadmissible. But saying that's it, uh, you submitted a, a manifestly fraudulent document, so I'm terminating this interview. Well, then you've deprived the person of the right to reply, procedural fairness. They may say, well, I can show to you that your assessment that this document is fraudulent is wrong, or I made a mistake on the document. Oh, I let somebody else fill it out and they made a mistake that I didn't catch. So there's all these excuses and rationalizations that the applicant, no matter how annoying the applicant is, has the right to present to you. It's the same again as a police function where uh, 
an officer sees somebody swerving in traffic, forms the initial impression that they may be intoxicated, but then they stop the off the person and explain their concerns. And the person who's being stopped is lucid enough to say, I'm diabetic. Yeah. And I'm having an insulin problem, in which case you have to, the officer has to immediately change to a humanitarian position and get the person to the hospital. I mean, there's no directed allergy <laughs> yeah. being a visa officer, but I don't think either that management would do it, or I, I really don't think it's a very good idea. If you're telling a person, well, I believe this document to be fraudulent, no matter how confident you are, the person may have a way of rebutting you. So you can't just terminate the interview uh, at that point. Yeah. Well, I don't know that you turn, I was just saying, like, I exercise discretion to not, uh, even though there's been misrep, to just do a warning. But I want to I want to switch gears no to the other because... There's no feature like a warning, and it's not like a cop. <laughs> yeah. You know, in that way, you can't issue just a warning to an applicant. Uh, what are you supposed to say? Well, damn it, don't ever submit a front <laughs> to a Canadian official again. No, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. One of the enforcement manuals now kind of hints at, like, that they have to determine if... Oh, an A44 report is merited and then if they should, but the courts have basically like kind of said what you're saying, which is no, your role is to, uh, if there is an A44 report, it sh that should be written, it should be prepared. I want to switch though, because uh, I don't want uh, to miss this other big question, which is sort of similar to what we've been talking about, which was um, reconsideration requests. Uh -huh. To what role do you think, what role do you think they should play? Uh, very little. Again, maybe I sound too authoritarian myself, but uh, it's the responsibility of the applicant and their counsel, if any, to present the full case uh, on the initial application. It is not the responsibility of uh, visa office staff to look for any little detail and say, are you sure that's right? Why don't you take another look at it? We'll send the application back. If yeah. it's a mistake, you can just apologize to us and everything will be uh, good. I don't think that maybe you need more flexibility in a refugee or humanitarian situation and that you're, you easily could be dealing with an applicant who's very stressed and very frightened. But for other types of applications, you pay your money and you take your chances. And it's not... You never want to establish a principle that it's up for the visa officer to dig, 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 and re, you know, uh, forgive, uh, just issue a warning. It's totally up to the applicant and counsel to do it right. If they want to take another round at it, pay another fee, submit another application, and it happens. It, uh, sometimes the circumstances change, and away you go. They might get their visa after all. Do you think there should be like uh, an appeal or just straight up uh, reapply? Well, what's the federal court for? Well, do you think that it, the federal court makes sense as the avenue for a, a visa refusal? Well, you see, who needs, and I'm not trying to please you guys, but who needs to undercut the immigration bar? I mean, uh, the federal court is the court where you present your case against unfair actions by a visa officer, I guess maybe other federal officers, I don't really know. Uh, I think it's a totally appropriate place to begin the process. Uh, we can't do all of this for free. Like you're spending the resources of somebody or other when you open up other lines of appeal. I don't think there should be any informal lines of appeal at all oh informal lines no i agree with you there um just not sure like the federal court i i mean i like judicial review is probably well at least half of what i do lately it seems and mm -hmm. it always strikes me as odd that like for a visitor visa refusal the recourse is either reapply although there's concerns with that process if it's already been refused once with the whole automated triaging and everything now that goes on how previously refusal could just lead to future triaging but that the courts that it has to go to a judge in Canada is always just struck me as a bit odd and probably more expensive well but for a different department as we talked last time it doesn't cost I just ask who else could do it I mean uh I suppose 
you could launch a civil procedure in a lower court alleging uh, unfair treatment, not by a visa officer or other locally engaged staff, uh, but would I want my manager or the office manager to make a determination about whether a, a case should be reopened without paying a fee? No. They're not good enough in some cases. Some of them are very fair, very, very knowledgeable people. But frankly, some of them are not good enough. And again, it opens up a potential rift between the managers and the visa office staff. Yeah. Uh, I think on my last, on my first interview, I gave the uh, example of the situation I had in Seattle, uh, where the temporary office manager was from domestic immigration in Vancouver, was doing her very, very best to uh, convince me to change my decision. And I gave her, like, I really listened very carefully. She showed nothing to me that showed me that I was in error. <clears throat> it was just a matter of opinion. And what I said to her in final is, if you would like to reopen this case and serve as the officer and do an entire reassessment, reassessment you will not in no way offend me or hurt my feelings. Yeah. Just go ahead and do it. But uh, to ask me to review my own decision, unless I did something manifestly wrong, uh, unfactual or failing in procedures of procedural fairness, what's the point? When might I say, oh, I'm a bad person, I'm a lousy visa officer, and I'm really sorry, so I'm going to open up that right now, and I'm going to send a letter of apology to the applicant okay. council? That's not the real world. No, and uh, under the current framework, like, as you mentioned, the whole, the person who decides is supposed to make the decision. We had a uh, judicial review once where it was interesting in that the visa office refused to provide the written reasons for refusal, the rule nine reasons for refusal, and instead filed affidavits from other visa officers, including a program manager who all said that officer's decision was completely unreasonable. We aren't going to say why, but we'd like the file just reopened. And we had to go through a whole, a whole thing about, would we get a copy of the reasons? Do they even have the, like, who cares what the other officers said? Mm -hmm. The federal court, apparently, I didn't attend the CBA conference last week, um, but I was getting emails from people who were there saying that in order to try to mitigate or manage the huge backlog on their end, they're going to start doing judicial reviews, a pilot project of no hearings. As soon as the judicial review is filed, IRCC will provide a whole copy of the certified tribunal record. Mm -hmm. Memorandum of argument will be limited. Some people were saying to me that it would be limited to a page. Others were saying it would be limited to a box. Uh, reply would be limited to a box and then a I'm, judge. I'm thinking AI limited. triage here uh, being used yeah. by the federal court. Uh, do we want to go there? Maybe the federal court, because of its caseload, will have to. It costs a lot to pay justices of the federal court. Mm -hmm. Well, so that's the thing is like, where is, um, does a procedure like that make sense in the court? Like a lot of them refuse, like I can divide JRs into two, uh, two types. There's the refusals where you're like, I can show why this is unreasonable in one sentence, just because of the software that the visa officers are using. And then the other ones where you're like, this is going to be a full hearing. And for those blatantly obvious ones that are going to be set aside, I just, like, it's, I don't know what the uh, the mechanism is, especially as you know, like the cost of a judicial review to the applicant is 50 bucks. Huh. Um, but so, you also like want the courts, the courts to be accessible is the whole idea. Does a visa office redetermine? I don't know. Well, see, I do, I'm trying to think as we talk, could this responsibility be downloaded onto lower courts? Well, say I'm back home in Winnipeg and somebody wants to pursue a case in the Court of Queen's Bench, if they still call it that, about something a visa officer did. How the hell is the Court of Queen's Bench going to know anything about immigration or what visa yeah. officers do? In my opinion, it's much, much better to have uh, justices of the federal court, who by this time sure as hell do know, know a lot about immigration. For 50 bucks, go to them. They can help yeah. you more. If something wrong has been done to you, the applicant... They are much more likely to spot it than the Court of Queen's Bench in Winnipeg. Oh. The, um, or just charging a fee. I mean, people are going to hate this idea when I say it. Well, actually, so 
I just pulled open because I wanted to make sure I get this right. In the British Columbia Provincial Nominee Program, uh, the application fee is $1,475. If it's refused and you want a reconsideration, that's $500. So there's some skin in the game, I guess, for the See, reconsideration. Well, it seems very fair to me. I mean, uh, this is sort of off the wall, but one proposal I keep thinking of is for the skilled worker and business components of uh, the immigration process, spin it off into a crown corporation. They can set appropriate fees and they would be able to reinvest what they make in fees in providing better, prompter and more efficient services. Uh, maybe that would be a better way of dealing with these things other than uh, rather than creating all sorts of alternatives to the federal court or this or that and the other yeah. thing. Uh, refugees and humanitarian are so different from uh, the skilled worker and business components of immigration that maybe they should operate under somewhat different principles. Maybe the standard of proof to refuse an applicant when they may be sitting in a refugee camp where they're still in desperate danger of their lives, God knows where, ought to be higher because the consequences of the visa officer decision to refuse their application or a member of the family class, like somebody's grandma or something, you know. Yeah, yeah. Was it really done? Well, of course, with the super visa, that's not quite the best example. But whoever, you know, maybe there should be a different standard of proof. And maybe the legislation should be changed so as to expand the humanitarian discretion of uh, these officers and their managers. But... I can't imagine immigration or the cabinet ever accepting that. Like to spin off a selected immigration to a crown corporation. No, I can't. I, I'll, definitely not in the current. Like there's, oh, there's, this is something that, you know, I uh, often remind or chat with immigration lawyers who are complaining about one facet of the system or how ridiculous it is or the other. Like everything. I don't want to use broken because that's become a political term, but um, I'm tired too. Yeah. Well, Canada, Canada's not a piece of machinery. It doesn't break. Yeah. Right. Um, but there's so many, like I saw that the two years later, the trial for one of the convoy people is going to like, there's just so like, there are so many delays um, and issues across the system right now that visa appeals, I don't think are going to be hard on the list. I've actually, Maybe you can uh, resolve. There's been this this Slack group that I'm a part of where people are saying we need more efficient screening for uh, Chinese nationals who the government is concerned may be inadmissible for espionage. And I keep They're saying racist. there's there's no public pressure to like have faster security screening for people no. uh, who may be inadmissible for espionage. Well, we might see the uh, how in what we view as unjust or unfairly it's being applied, but like from a public pressure dollar standpoint. No one's going to say we'd like to raise the taxes of Canadians in no. order to do faster screening. Why should the taxpayer be on the hook for any aspect of uh, selected or business immigration, including appeals or fraud investigations? Why? Why should, okay, so somebody wants to immigrate to the Toronto area and eventually flip properties. Why is some farm person like a farm in Saskatchewan what is the justification for laying an extra tax burden on that farmer for somebody who's going to go to Toronto and do something or other there? What? Yeah. And I this know. is where like the current government, credit to them, are trying to, I think, set and adjust immigration fees to more reflect the cost of things, including auto adjustments for inflation. Uh -huh. um, Which I think is entirely, I mean, we know what the general rate of inflation is from year to year. Yeah. Why not make it automatic? My pension. No, they are. It's every two years. It's automatic it. tied to inflation. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it like tied to inflation or something that tied to like PSAC wages. It would be the more accurate like measure I mean, of what it costs. Well, that means you're starting to mess with PSAC and you don't want to go there. And PSAC is not responsible for how the government organizes and uses the staff. I mean, there's obviously legislation. Yeah. And as I said before, there's no such thing as a, a, 
a government department being allowed to have a culture, but it goes back on the management, you know, and the senior management here in Ottawa to do it right. So, you know, again, you, you have this whole bunch of people racing around and doing Canada's immigration program. How many people, I mean, except for inflammatory articles, you know, on the social media, how many Canadians really, really care about it? Why should they pay for it? Why would it be a special interest to, to somebody to really look into immigration unless they're a crackpot? But you want, yeah. to keep, you want to keep the public separate and, un, and unburdened as possible from this entire process. It's not their responsibility. And it may be something that's not at all important in their lives. It shouldn't be on them. You mean the mechanism or the numbers? Uh, both. Both? Yeah. Now, the only thing is, uh, and I had uh, some comments in Quora about one or two questions that I did about immigration levels. Uh, the levels are partly a political thing, but they don't get, somebody doesn't throw paper on the floor in downtown Ottawa, you know, in their senior manager office to determine the level. Uh, the politicians are responsible for hearing briefings from officials, absorbing that information, someone not so good at it, but nevertheless, theoretically, that's the basic of our West, Westminster process. Uh, the politicians and the politicians in power receive these briefings and they say, oh, the uh, size of the Canadian labor force is declining because the labor force is aging and the birth rate is very low. So what the hell are we going to do? So it can't be a public exercise because if you do that, you skew far to the right. Because a lot of people are opposed to immigration and I'm not, I'm not disputing with them or pointing the finger at them. What if you simply don't believe in unlimited diversity or multiculturalism, but prefer a more homogenous Canada and are strongly involved against further growth of the population on environmental grounds, you know, and you just don't want a lot of immigrants coming in. They have the right to their opinion, but they're going to speak louder in many cases, and particularly the, the nuttier part. Yeah of that public commentating, commentating population. And people think, well, generally, I guess immigration is a good thing. And I just gassed up yesterday and I went in to pay and the attendant seemed to be an immigrant but was really, really nice. I got no quarrel with them. I mean, how is the general public going to know how many personal support workers are needed in the seniors care homes of Manitoba? And that's the bottom line. I said it in Cora. That is the bottom line line you want my i want my mom and dad to be cared for adequately in the seniors home do i care about process or prioritization or anything no i don't care if they're speaking to Galog on lunch break i just want it taken care of and that's my sole interest in the immigration process don't bother me with levels arguments or you know other stuff i have other things to look to in my life i think it's a totally legitimate position immigration is not everything this may sound strange coming from a retired visa officer. It's just one more facet of what federal and provincial governments do. It should not be reified. You know, it should be kept in its place. And the costs, to the extent possible, should be kept in their place. And the public cannot be expected to know, and I'm not, I'm not demeaning the general Canadian public, but the means at which they look at immigration levels and which categories immigrants should be prioritizes far beyond what you could expect a member of the general public to know. So it needs to be the way it is, in my opinion. Uh, you know, you, you write your memo, it goes through 15 different drafts until it's been made in, as innocuous uh, as possible. It goes up, up, up the line to the assistant desk, deputy minister. And yeah. also, so I don't even know what the relative functions are. They decide whether the minister responsible for immigration ought to be briefed. I know a lot of people thinking of it as a secretive, an elitist process, but it is for a good reason. It, uh, I mean, I'd really, really like right now we're in a, a time when it seems like the consensus on immigration, it's almost cliche to say at this point, but seems to be falling apart. And I'd love to know like a read a decade from now, kind of when in 2023 at the political level, did they start to realize, okay, we've got a problem and pivot 
because 2023, when 2022, 2023, when I read the press releases, it's all, we're going to grow the economy through uh, population growth increases, where international students are the future to almost, not overnight, but over a rapid period, a complete switch with the polls mm -hmm. and to just learn when did they realize that um, they had a problem. When people couldn't uh, find a place to live anymore in Brampton. Yeah, when people couldn't, yeah, when you had the six basements being rented to 60 people, homeless international students. Uh, um, yeah, it'll be, uh, and rents just, you know, yeah, it'll be uh, very curious. I don't recall whether I mentioned it in my previous interview. Well, I think I do remember it. It's not the function of line level memo drafters at yeah. immigration headquarters, uh, not far away from where I'm sitting now, to look at things like housing. If the federal government does not make itself conscient of the implications of what one ministry is doing, as opposed to what another ministry is doing, or a provincial government, or a municipal government, well, <laughs> You can't expect line workers in the federal government to do anything about that. They've got to bite the bullet. Now, in terms of the supposed separation of the opinions about immigration, as I just said, I don't think a large part of the Canadian population could care less because immigration is not a thing in their life. Like mom and dad are not sitting in Beijing, you know, trying yeah. to get a permanent immigration <laughs> visa. Uh, in fact, the Jewish old folks home in Winnipeg is well staffed. And when I went in there, the Philip, you know, again, I, I don't mean to stipulate a nationality, but these are generally Filipino workers. They couldn't have been more nice and caring to my mom. That's the limit, you know. So if on one side, you've got quite far to the right people who are angry, not just about levels, but it's all melded up with the distrust of government, a feeling that the current government here in Ottawa is remote from the interests of the general public, which maybe sometimes it is when they talk about housing, and simply uncaring about the opinions of average Canadians, where people feel Western alienation, feel that Western perspectives on how immigration ought to run are not being respected. So they're gonna talk, they're gonna talk loud. And with the social media, uh, they've got all, the scope in the world to do their talking. Then on the other side, you have people who want to set up camps and university campuses. You know, who demand that any refugee uh, without screening be admitted to Canada because some government is being so beastly. Uh, but this is, I don't want to talk, yeah, I want to talk about the silent majority. I'm going to use a Republican term, although I don't think I'd be yeah. voting for them. Uh, <laughs> There's this very large silent majority of Canadians that don't bother me with that. I just want the mom and dad uh, to get a good level of care. When I go to the gas station, I prefer to come inside to pay rather than paying in the pump when it's three below zero in Regina. Uh, and I go in and there's this nice person who looks like an immigrant, but speaks enough English to, to serve me and is courteous and respectful about it. That's a limit of what they care about. The average Canadian does not want to participate in a dialogue about the goods and evils of immigration. I think generally the view is still modestly positive, although when you had a situation at the Quebec border where people were just flowing in, that could have tilted the whole Canadian perspective of immigration far negative. Federal government did something about it. I think they, even they understood that the whole Canadian perception of immigration was badly at risk. Uh, but beyond that, I don't think the general public much cares. Do you think the development of like you know, the conservatives say having a three point percentage point over the liberals to now a 20 point percentage is based on just an, a tiredness of Trudeau or cost of living where people may associate record population growth with that high cost of living. Well, not everybody has a high cost of living. You're sitting there in Regina, you're not being hit. You're sitting there in Brandon, Manitoba, you know, or St. John, New Brunswick. It's That's a big city problem and the outskirts of big cities. So you've got your Vancouver and you've got your Surrey. Even in Surrey, house prices are going wild. Uh, you're sitting in Toronto, but even in Orangeville, Ontario, prices are going wild. Not every Canadian is in that situation. A lot of them already bought their homes because they were baby boomers back when you could actually buy one if you're middle class. Uh, it just... 
I can speak as a Western Canadian. Okay. Uh, Pierre Trudeau was very much disliked, very much disliked. Uh, people are still angry. And Eastern people can say, well, you Western people, you hold a grudge too long. We don't care. <laughs> If I can still use the word, term we after living in Ottawa for so many years, but as an expat Winnipegger, we don't care. You know, we are just mad at Pierre Trudeau, even deceased. We transferred our anger to Justin Trudeau. Unfortunately, if I was sitting back in Winnipeg and talking with somebody local about it, unfortunately, though I don't dislike Justin Trudeau, he's a pretty good target. Yeah. He comes across as being very, very elitist. Uh, uh, he makes bad judgments about self-presentation that are glaring. Again, I'm not trying to influence the next federal election, uh, but there's real, real issues from the point of view of many Canadians about Justin Trudeau, aside from angry memories about uh, his dad. The actual substantive issues, housing, not Canada-wide, uh, taxes, everybody hates taxes. I don't think most Canadians would be, you know, simple enough to believe with Pierre Paul ever said, you just vote for me, your tax income tax is going down 30%. Hmm. People are smarter than that. Yeah. People are often more focused politically on local issues like provincial issues, because provinces provide most of the day-to-day -day services that you really have to rely on, or your municipal issues, who's going to plow the snow after a blizzard. So people just are looking at that issue and look how bad that liberal cabinet minister dealt with it. They don't know the names of the cabinet ministers in many cases. It's not, and then neither should they. It's not important. Yeah. And I'm taking my man out of the Ottawa box and the prairie <laughs> and transferring it back to the prairies. It's not important. So I think, I don't think immigration is an issue amongst Canadians who are not going to vote for the Conservative Party federally or parties that are more extreme federally, it's an issue for them. They're going to not going to vote for the Liberal Party. Anyhow. Nothing you could say to them would ever convince them to get over their anger at Justin Trudeau. So I don't think immigration is a big part of the equation. And while the housing in issue is very important, like I'm not dismissing the situation of a single mom with kids who's desperately looking for a place to put a roof over their heads in Toronto, but that housing issue is not an issue for a lot of Canadians. If it was, the federal and the provincial and municipal governments would doing, be doing a hell of a lot more about it. Yeah. So that's my I take on how immigration and immigration policies and the behavior of visa officers and local and gay staff impact the Canadian public. Most of them have no idea about what is going on in the visa office, and they couldn't care less. They wouldn't even know what a visa office is. And that takes point get into long explanations about what I did. Oh, if yeah, they, no, I, I'm, I definitely agree that most, for most people, it probably doesn't go beyond, and I would even separate immigration, too high, too low, refugee, too high, too low, because I think it. people view them as separate. Right. Um, the last question that I have is going back to... Um, what you'd said earlier about your visa officer and your manager possibly might not like you. And from what I've seen within and in chatting with former just federal government employees, but maybe specific in the immigration space, is that it's, I think, so there's, there seems to be a lot of like inter-office politics uh -huh. the public um you know there's a a bit of a resentment or frustration that the public often just views all civil servants as lazy the mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> there's fighting now with um between PSAC and the feds over going back to work yeah. three days per week when i had thought that they had just negotiated a contract for yeah. two days i have opinions about that that are probably relevant to our discussion today um yeah, well, but I, I, guess I think the... I think Treasury Board made a dreadful mistake. So speaking with the mentality of a civil servant, it was clear the Treasury Board made a commitment that any request to return to the office will consider the circumstances of the individual employee. Instead, they blew it out the window, went right back to generic, uh, you know, putting visa officers and all federal employees in some type of abstract box. So it's very, very foolish in my opinion.
Yeah, but like with all that, so, um, oh, and pay being lockstep. So you've got public thinks lazy, highly political office. The, as you said, instead, I guess in, what I would, the way I would reword it is instead of people being treated individually in terms of their work environment, it's everybody back to work three days in the office, lockstep pay. Like to someone starting out in the civil service, what tips or recommendations would you give them in terms of like having a long, productive, thriving career? Don't join the federal public service. <laughs> uh, you know, don't, 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 don't. Uh, I meet a fair amount of young people, and I'll be the first here in Ottawa where federal public service jobs are obviously something that's in the conscience of young people. Don't. Maybe a provincial government is where you'd feel happier because I'm sometimes provincial departments, certainly in the smaller provinces, the less populous ones, they're simply more intimate and there's simply more scope and more variety of work to be done. Uh, also, can I use the term non-arrogant provinces? Uh, I like to think of my Manitoba, my Saskatchewan, uh, New Brunswick, all the Atlantic provinces as non-arrogant provinces. They're not big attitude provinces. I mean, you get the occasional individuals totally obnoxious, but by and large, no. <laughs> yeah. Say you work for uh, a Manitoba department. Uh, the minister of the Manitoba department is not going to have his nose very high in the air. It's a little department compared to the big federal ones. Uh, the civil servants have maybe more job satisfaction. Now, here's something, again, I don't think I mentioned it in my previous interview, there's a very important difference between how visa officers get promoted and appraised as opposed to how most civil servants, either at the federal, political, or municipal levels do. Uh, the visa officer service is like the military. You get promoted to level. Yeah. And then... You mean like PM1, PM2, or...? Well, the thing is, not quite like that, but... Uh, there's a certain pot every year. There's a certain pot of positions for promotions for people who did well on their annual public appraisals in the visa service. And that's it. So you don't apply for promotion. Your appraisal is your tacit application to be promoted. You don't have to you can actually choose to say that I wish this appraisal to be ignored, which is not good for you. But generally, that's all there is, your appraisal. You're not really allowed a rebuttal or anything. You're not normally offered another chance, say, for a few months to really show that you've cleaned up your act. And now you treat managers with respect. You follow all instructions. And you study the law a lot better and all the regulations. No. It's one shot every year, promotion to level. And that is not at all like how it works in most of the rest of the civil service. So say you're working for Justice Canada or one of these places, you see a particular higher level position being offered for a senior lawyer. Either you decide that, oh, I don't think I can take this on, I think I can make my case. You have to actively file an application. Or you might say, no, maybe not. Maybe it's not my time yet. Something else will come up in a couple of months. Maybe that would be better and give me a better shot at promotion. These officers don't have that. They're under the thumb of that annual performance appraisal and they don't get to apply for a specific position. I mean, how many people would actually want to work in a situation like that? No, it's... Yeah, it, it, even applying for... I mean, law is very informal, like private law firms in terms of how promotions are partners usually just tap on the shoulder like the whole civil service seems completely different it is uh, again last in my last interview we were talking about why private sector principles could not be applied to the public service well there's no supply and demand in the public service of canada there's no like you don't have like a real firecracker young lawyer who already knows a lot of people and is bringing a lot of accounts in. You know, all these dynamics, which are appropriate, entirely appropriate yeah. in the private sector world, are irrelevant to a allocation-driven uh, authority. Oh, I don't want to use the term authoritarian, but very hierarchical, hierarchical system. 
There's no comparison. Well, and increasingly, everyone's just hired on contracts, which we talked about last time. Yeah, and that we talked at some yeah. about the uh, good and bad sides of people being hired on contract. But when you apply for a contract in the federal government, normally you have to go through an agency. You don't yeah. get directly for a contract. And you can be dismissed at any time. There's no protection against dismissal. And there's no need for the dismissing uh, federal department to show any cause whatsoever. They just advise the uh, eight-year agency if the contract is terminated. Yeah. Hmm. There's no comparison to be made. Uh, well, whining, whining. Uh, my position is that visa officers, again, as I said before, are not treated with dignity and they get really the short end of the stick <sighs> yeah that's uh it's a bit of a sad note to end it on but i'm well, trying to think of a way to positively spin that on a happy note but um well as i yeah. said if the immigration bar has issues with things that are going on uh we used to get when the immigration bar was young these pages and before the, the era of email pages and pages long letters saying, oh, that visa officer is nasty and isn't this, that, and the other thing. And why aren't you more humane? That officer is a really bad person. Can't you reopen this with another officer? Don't do that. Don't do that. It's irrelevant. It, like, grow some courage. And if the bar in general, and I think the bar knows how to form a general opinion, you have your conferences, you have your symposia, and if you really feel, feel that something is wrong, identify it, maybe build up your expertise in how the bureaucracy of immigration actually works, uh, and then write a scathing letter to the politicians. Both, or Deanna can just be dictator of the Treasury Board, as she said last time. Yeah, uh, somebody needs to talk to the president of the Treasury Board about a bunch of things. Uh, my impression is that Again, I understand why immigration lawyers are heavily based on defending their their uh, their their customers, not the best word, their clients. Uh, but if that's all you want to do, then you have no right to complain. You have no right to complain, and you have no right to attack any of these officers who can't defend themselves. Like we can't write a rebuttal. So if some yeah, it's uh, it's similar to judges how they can't. Uh... No, it's some immigration respond. lawyer. Okay, so the immigration lawyer writes, you know, entirely unjustified, uh, basically libeling type of representation. I can't go back as a visa officer and hire a lawyer and go after that person for libel. Uh, Where does, are you like, okay, I mean, I know you're not talking about judicial review where someone says a decision's unreasonable. Are you talking like lawyers who just, cold email a visa officer or uh -huh. yeah or cold write or cold 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 write to the office's uh manager they wouldn't normally know who your immediate manager is but they'll certainly know who the uh the manager of the entire office is uh, no there is a decorum like i do a, i mean through a tips i do a lot of a tips of the uh that immigration representative's email address where reps can ask general questions uh -huh. and i see some reps you know writing back to yeah, they have a free service where they ask a question, the department will write the, you know, they'll, God knows what goes on internally, but there'll be a bunch of emails to figure out an answer. They'll respond to the rep and the rep will write back saying, oh, useless. Thanks for nothing. And I'm just like, yeah. where do you, what's the, what's the advantage in doing that? But, uh, I think if immigration lawyers would convince themselves a visa officer is a relatively low level bureaucrat under tight control by their managers, doing a heavily defined job that's already been stripped of most of its subjectivity by various changes in the act to make it more objective, and even more so now by the use of AI. I mean, these the bar constantly writes about being more humane, more compassionate. Where's the conscience about the way visa officers are treated? I've never seen a visa. Well, and I think that part of what we're trying to do with these episodes is kind of show that more. Like, I don't think the public has a clue. Well, I had talked about, I don't remember if it was with you or with um, another former visa officer, Corey Clamp, that I was chatting with someone who hosted a party in Asia 
And when he learned that there was an IRCC visa officer there, he had had a previous application where IRCC had refused, I believe, his mother-in-law's application. And he made the show of asking the visa officer to leave, which I thought was unfair. And I don't know. I don't think I talked about it with you. Maybe we talked about it with someone else. Yeah. Yeah. No, and that was sort of like where uh, what the other uh, person had said as well. And also, here's another point. What if that visa officer you direct to leave your party is a female or a person of color or a person with a disability? God help you. Yeah. God help you. You might be able to get away with behaving like that towards a Caucasian male visa officer with no disabilities. You try to do that with somebody else who uh, Canadian society defines as sometimes a victim. Well, go for it. Go for it. And remember, if I go to some party, uh, I'm not... Well, it's also just what's the upside in general beyond, like, that brief moment of feeling, like, high and mighty. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, these officers are not always the best people, nor, frankly, members of the immigration bar. There's some very good ones, very fair ones, highly, highly knowledgeable in the law, excellent at presenting their, their client's case. But frankly, having seen all sorts of presentations by... Uh, immigration lawyers some of them aren't so good and then we have the consultant community and i'll go out and limb. i don't think immigration consultants should exist except as paralegals in some immigration lawyer's office martin we might have to do a third episode on that i can I hear i can them. hear uh people yelling what because i think a lot of our audience are consultants so we might have to do a third uh a third episode i'm prepared to defend myself and i've met some very good consultants but uh Problems, 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 problems. And some of the most atrocious behavior that these yeah, well, are... well, hold oh. off. We'll save it. We'll save it for a third. Okay. Uh, I have the interest of time. That's, we'll that's save for it my for next round. Episode. Yeah. Give me a chance uh... to get in the third interview and I'll be happy to. Yeah. Awesome. Sounds good.